everyone. Thank you for joining us again for another episode of Resiliency Radio with Dr. Jill. Today, I have special guest, Dr. Howard Elkin, who I'll introduce in a moment. We're going to talk about medical advocacy, but we have an integrative cardiologist with us today. So we're going to talk a little bit about heart health as well. Um, Before we begin, let me introduce you, Dr. Elkin. So Dr. Howard Elkin has practiced cardiology in Whittier, California since 1986. He graduated with highest honors in the Medical College of Virginia in 1979, completed his internship and residency in internal internal medicine at Michael Reese Hospital and Medical Center in Chicago, followed by a fellowship in clinical cardiology at Northwestern University. We share some Chicago roots too. <laughs> um, Dr. Elkin moved to Southern California in 1984, where he completed an additional fellowship in invasive cardiology at the Los Angeles Heart Institute. He realized in the early 90s that mainstream cardiology focused on diagnosing and treating patients, and patients were not staying healthy long term. In 1984, I'm sorry, 1994, he added a preventative component to his practice with the HeartWise Fitness Institute, combining sound nutrition, exercise, and stress management. His patients are empowered to live happier, healthier, and less stressful lives. Uh, Welcome to the show, Dr. Elkin. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here today. You're welcome. And I'm delighted to talk to you about all things cardiology, about your own journey, about your new book, about everything there. But I always love to start with story as far as where did you grow up? How did you get interested in medicine? Were there any other doctors in your family? And then how did you get interested in integrative medicine? Yeah, no one's asked me that. That's a great question. Well, I, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, and um, no, my, I didn't have a medical family. I mean, my father didn't graduate high school. Uh, my mother did, um, and I'm the one. I'm the second of four children, and I I never had a doctor's kit when I was a kid growing up. You know, I didn't have any of that. Uh, but I was fascinated in anatomy. I remember that. Remember the world? I don't know if you remember the yes. world book in media with those little cellophane pages. Uh-huh. I would like study all the all the layers things. right you'd pull the yes. <laughs> so much fun, uh, you know so um and then i didn't really know i was i really was gonna i wanted to be a writer and then i said well maybe you should be a lawyer because that kind of goes hand in hand but then i think i really didn't like law so i then became I, I got interested again in medicine but it really wasn't until my senior year in high school did i decide to really pick that so in college i was kind of double major in biology and also in english so it was good. And um, so how I got into cardiology, when I started my medical school training, you know, they take you through the various medical, various organ systems. First, in the first year, it's normal physiology and anatomy. Second year, it's pathology. And then the third year on, it's clinical. And when I when I got to the cardiovascular system, like it just made sense to me. I didn't have to memorize things like an endocrinology and infectious disease. It just made perfect sense. Um, so I was always interested. I didn't make the final decision until I was getting close to actually my internship and residency, but I always had a penchant for the heart. Then I came out to California. I was married at the time, had a child, and uh, so I actually was brought out here for a group, a large multi-specialty group in cardiology, but it really wasn't my thing. So after a year, I went back to training in invasive cardiology and then subsequently started my own practice in 1986 and here was his young cardiologist and i was traditionally trained we knew nothing about functional medicine i don't think the term was coined then right and um but by the time and that was in 86 by the time then early 90s i saw the writing on the wall people were flocking to hmos and um and I, and I saw the same patients come back. You know, they'd had a heart attack, then they'd have a stent, then they'd have another stent. And something's not right about the system because patients aren't really getting better. We're putting a Band-Aid on and then they come back with the you know, same problem, you know, within a couple, few years. And it goes along with cardiac rehab and people that choose exercise programs because 50% of these people are no longer exercising within six months. So there's something about lifestyle that I saw was truly lacking. So then I'd advise, and I called it the... Uh, Hartwise Fitness Institute back then. And I incorporated, I had a trainer and we had a nutritionist and we counseled people. We even had group meetings once a week to kind of base on Dean Ornish's group studies on having cardiac patients talk about issues that they don't normally talk about. So that was exciting. Then I got into longevity side. This, we're almost finished. Um, okay. and, and then I took the fellowship and I added 
basically uh, hormones and uh, longevity medicine in the early 2000s. And that's where I'm at. So I call myself an integrative cardiologist uh, practicing functional medicine. So I use the functional medicine t- principles that we all use, uh, but mostly from a cardiologic standpoint. But, you know, like you can't separate the gut. I'm, I, I'm in, really interested in gut because most of the patients that come to see me as a cardiac patient, about 60% of them have a gut issue. Mm-hmm. So that's what I love about functional medicine. You have to be versed in almost all the specialties, at least the internal medicine specialties, because there's an integration that goes on that we just don't see. You know, in traditional medicine, it's like, oh, no, this is a heart problem. No, no, you got to go to the pulmonologist. It's yeah. a lung problem. And I see this battling happen all the time. And so this gives me a lot of pleasure to be practicing how I am now. And that's and that's the beauty of being in your own practice. Um, if I was in a large group, I couldn't do this. Yeah, so, you're right. Yeah. The joy. I see this all the time with colleagues who are kind of getting burnt out and frustrated. The joy of why we went into what we're doing is really revived when we do functional and integrative medicine because we're actually really usually connecting deeply, having these relationships, um, helping people to heal. Um, and again, there's nothing wrong if you're not, you know, have a heart attack or you have a car accident or you have a, in fact, you were in one of the best um, realms for conventional medicine because you could intervene and save a person's life, really. But Thank like you. you said, then when they come, back and they're not doing better after several years or they've fallen off the bandwagon, we both realized there was a lot more. So good for you. Um, I love that. So let's start with just, um, obviously you are interventional, so you're doing stents and all of that. And again, there's a place for those as life-saving, but as far as the real life saving the life saving band aid. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Let's maybe talk just a little bit about because I feel like as I'm uh, understanding the heart and and the endothelium and all this, there is so much more. And really, at the root, it's kind of the endothelium that matters. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you've learned and and the kinds of things that we can do to actually heal endothelium and the nitric oxide and those basic tenants versus just put a stent in an emergency. That's such a great question. Thank you for asking. So the endothelium is everything. Uh, um, it's, it's just for your for your listeners um, that all your vessels. We have sixty thousand miles of blood vessels in our body. Can you imagine that? Sixty thousand miles, and every one of those vessels is lined with one cell thick called the endothelium. Endo means inside in Greek. So that well cell well, one cell thick is very very important because it first of all it can it can manuf- it can make nitric oxide which helps these vessels to dilate and number two um it's semi permeable so it disallows things like we don't want like L- oxidized ldl cholesterol and other harmful substances to enter the endothelium and that's when inflammation begins and that's really when you have heart disease but in traditional cardiology they don't talk about endothelium they don't talk about um it's not about prevention. You have high cholesterol, you go on a statin. I mean, I'm simplifying things and generalizing, but that's basically how it is. Every When someone gets discharged from the hospital with a stent, I can guarantee you they're going to be an aspirin, a statin, a beta blocker, Plavix or a platelet inhibitor, and usually something like, and, a, you know, they're, they're on four or five medicines, even if they were on nothing before. So that's just how it's done. So um, looking at the endothelium and also... I'm very much interested in blood pressure control because I think it's still the number one risk factor. And what I, I forgot the number is it keeps on rising. When I wrote my book, it was like 70, 70. I mean, there's like 100,000 people out there more. Usually 50% of the population is hypertensive. Why? Yeah. Um, and so I try to look at the preventative side and, you know, weight issues, yeah. you know, definitely weight loss. If someone loses 10% of their current rate, they'll drop their blood pressure. Almost, I can guarantee that. Mm. But, um, and, you know, it does get more prominent as we get older. There's a genetic tendency. But I, but that's all, it's all about the endothelium. So if you treat the endothelium, you, you can't treat the endothelium without controlling the blood pressure. Because the blood pressure, if it's hypertensive, it'll destroy the endothelium. And there's one test that I do that most people don't know about. It used to be called the pulse test, P-U-L-S. And now it's called um, Smart Vascular DX. And it's a fascinating test because it's the only test that I know of that actually looks at the health of your endothelium. And so it's a, it's a great test. Most doctors don't know about it, but it can actually, you get, you get seven different biomarkers specific for the endothelium. And I tell patients, I'm not, we're not treating your biomarkers. 
I'm treating your risk. But if you're, and you, you found out when this test, whether you're high, medium, or low risk, and it's really helpful because then I can intervene with certain supplements yes. before they have a problem. So it's all That's about same. prevention and getting it at the beginning, at the start. Is this a blood test or an ultrasound or what kind of a test? It's a blood test. It's a simple blood test. They're out of Irvine, California. And um, again, the name was Pulse, P-U-L-S. But now if you look up Smart Vascular DX, um, you can, you know, the, the website. It's just, it's, it's an unusual test. Most doctors don't do it. I don't think most doctors even know about it. Right. Um, but, you know, I do it. In other words, when I have a patient come into my office, I'm, I, tell, I tell them from the beginning, my, my my plan is to assess your risk, not just treat you with drugs. Let's assess your risk and let's figure out what you need. Yes. So it's, it's custom care. Yeah. It, it, it's customized care. And I think it's the, the optimal way of doing it. So I will often do certain tests. I won't usually do this as test number one, but I will do things like Cleveland Heart Lab or Boston Heart Lab. Uh, which we can talk more about, and also some oftentimes a coronary calcium scan. Yeah. So anyway, oh, that's so really kind of the way. No, I love this because I couldn't agree more. And things that maybe let's maybe talk a little bit about some of these labs, like you said, uh, MPO, uh, TMAO, PLAC, uh, HSCRP. Many people know about, but some of these, especially the Cleveland and Boston Heart Labs, both have a lot of these inflammatory markers. And you don't have to right. talk about all of them. Maybe pick a few of your favorites, and let's talk to the yes. person listening about why they might want to ask their doctor for some of these tests. Uh, Because it really does give us, like you said, with functional medicine, we're looking at where is someone on the trajectory of wellness or disease? And are they walking towards a possible stroke or heart attack or incident? And if they are, then you and I can say, hey, you're at risk. And this is what we can do to actually reverse your trajectory. So maybe talk a little bit about some of your favorite um, inflammatory marker or or test that maybe the patient isn't aware of. Mm. Now, Cleveland Heart Lab and Boston Heart Diagnostics are both excellent labs. They're they're very comprehensive cardiac labs. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cleveland is a little more easily available because it's now was bought out by Quest a few years ago. So you just go to Quest Lab and they can draw your blood and they send it to Cleveland. Mm-hmm. Boston is a smaller lab and you have to have a phlebotomist and we have various phlebotomists that can do this, that can go to your house and actually draw the blood. But uh, but they both are very similar. So number one, it's the lipids. Okay. Okay, the cholesterol and triglycerides. You know, your average doctor is still getting cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, LDL. That's basically it. Um, so with Cleveland, you're not only getting those values, you're getting the size of the particle and the number of particles. So it's prognostically more important. Like, and I want your listeners to know, just remember one thing when it comes to LDL, low density cholesterol. We think of that as lousy and HDL is healthy, but it's not quite that simple. So low density or LDL cholesterol can be, it really depends on the particle size. So we want large fluffy particles and not small dense ones because the small dense LDL particles can get easily oxidized and then it can get into the walls of the endothelium if the endothelium is not healthy. And then you got the beginning of inflammation. Yeah. So that information you, you you get right off the bat with, with Boston or Cleveland. Then you have the inflammatory markers. Um, and so some of the ones that, well, they, Everyone in my practice gets uh, HSCRP, which is highly sensitive C-reactive protein. Um, a lot of doctors don't even draw that, but you have to you have to know where they where the patients are, at least so the, and you, would, you can follow it. It's an inexpensive test, and you can follow it sequentially. Then I do a couple other biomarkers, uh, sorry, uh, inflammatory markers that you can get both with with um, Cleveland and Boston. It's called the LPPLA2, and please don't ask. It's a long enzyme. Anyway, that's looking for vascular inflammation. Is there inflammation in the vessel itself? CRP is totally non-specific, but very sensitive. Yes. LPPLA2 and also myeloperoxidase. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are two markers that you get with these tests, and they help determine if you have any systemic inflammation. They also have a test to see whether you have any oxidized LDL. But it's really, that's the LDL we worry about. It's not LDL. It's not some kind of villain. Because, I mean, if we didn't have LDL cholesterol, we wouldn't get, we wouldn't get to the brain. Right. Right. Now, I don't want a good heart with a bad brain. So, yeah, I always um, say, like, cholesterol is not the bad guy. Cholesterol makes our hormones. It makes up our brain. Cholesterol right. is 
thing we absolutely need. However, if the endothelial yeah. lining is sticky, there's inflammation, there's all these other things, even autoimmune disease, which people don't typically associate with heart disease, then that cholesterol, like you said, the oxidized LDL gets sticky. That's the issue, not cholesterol itself. Cholesterol itself is neutral, right? Right. I'm, and, 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 but even most cardiologists, I do, yeah. I, I see, don't really get into this because it does involve education. But yes. See, I love to, <laughs> but like you, the joy I get in practicing medicine is developing relationships with my patients, you know, and it's, it's just, it's just very fascinating. So I did leave out one thing besides uh, when you go back to the lipids on these sophisticated labs, you also get what's called LP little a, the little a is in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Now that is a fragment of LDL and it, doesn't bode well for heart disease because it's very sticky, very inflammatory, can easily get oxidized. Again, start the inflammatory process if it goes into the damaged endothelium. So there's been no treatment thus far for this, which is probably why the top cardiologists aren't interested in it. Actually, I've had quite a bit of success using niacin, which is actually yeah. vitamin B3. But there will be coming, uh, probably within two years, a biologic will be coming out that will deal with LP little a, which is really important because it's about 27% of the population. It's not small. Yeah. And with this biologic, we'll be able to decrease LP little a by as much as 50% or more in a period of six weeks. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected, Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Period of six weeks. So wow. that's going to be that's you find that i'm just going to ask you about that because i feel clinically the same way it's hard i always say this is a little bit more difficult to change so the nice and potentially but do you find that's more genetic or is it more lifestyle inflammatory that it, you see uh, elevated lp little it's definitely genetic okay that's what i thought and mm -hmm. it is genetic um because and again you don't know you have it unless you, unless you do the test and it's automatic in the in the boston and in the cleveland heart lab so um, and it's, I think it's important to know because patients need to know the risk. Yes. Uh, and, and I tell them about it. Even if we can't get it down to optimal levels, I'm going to try to do everything else. And, you know, it's not, it's like the best of all possible worlds. You want to lower everything, but you, you can, unless they respond well to niacin. And, and I would say over 50, 60% of my patients do, but I really know niacin well. So I, I know how to dose it correctly and how to people start people on it. Then, all right, so we've got the lipids, we've got the inflammatory profile. Then we have the metabolic profile, which is really important. So yeah, they do a fasting blood sugar and they do the hemoglobin A1C, which gives you an idea of how well your blood sugar has been controlled in the previous three months. It's a marker on the red blood cell and red blood cells live 90 days. Um, so then it tells you other tests that I really think are important. Your fasting insulin level, which should be, I think, less than eight, certainly less than 10. I say less than uh, five. <laughs> so I, I totally think agree. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why the interesting thing about being a bodybuilder is that most strength athletes have are very insulin sensitive. So we tend to have really low value, low levels of, of insulin. So we want to know what that is because, and, and and let me just digress for one second. We also do what's called a C-peptide. Yeah. So C-peptide tells me how well your pancreas is, how hard your pancreas is working because you could have a normal A1C, an elevated insulin and an elevated uh C peptide, and that's telling me that your your body, your pancreas is working really hard to not make you a full fledged uh -huh. diabetic. But eventually, if the insulin level doesn't come down, your the pancreas will poop out. It just yeah. can't keep on producing insulin for years and years. So I really like so everybody gets the insulin inflammatory markers and the metabolic markers because 
really only about 5% of the country's population is metabolically healthy, which is, we were not a healthy country. Right. And I think that worse in COVID. And the other one is genetic markers. And that's what I like. So there's about five that I follow. One is KIF-6, which is kind of, you know, I like that because I, I spent some time in Berkeley Heart Lab with Dr. Superco several years ago. So KIF-6 is a is associated with premature heart disease or coronary artery disease. NP21 seems to be, they call it the heart attack gene. Um, and it's really common. And about 50% 50, 50 of it have at least one carrier. So it's it's very, it's it's very, it's rampant. Um, then I do the, there's 4Q25, I don't know, it's on the fourth chromosome. Uh -huh. And it, that that pre, that lets you know that you could be predisposed to having developed cardiac um, atrial fibrillation, which is the most common arrhythmia that we see, especially in people over the age of 70. Um, and then I'm leaving something out. Oh, APOE. Yes. APOE is really important. <laughs> yeah. Because APOE tells me cardiac wise, if you, uh, and if it's, if, if it's elevated, if you have one or more mark, uh, one or more of the alleles, or, then that means you're at risk of coronary disease because that means you, these people tend to absorb more mm -hmm. cholesterol from their diet. Yeah. And it's also associated with Alzheimer's. So mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, and it's, I think it's good to know this because then I talk to people about brain health yeah. and what they can do to obviate, you know, problems on the line. And I'm, I'm in agreement with, with Dr. President and Perlmutter that I, I think we can put a damper on Alzheimer's disease, yes. But, yes. We, but it's an active process. It's like heart disease. It's not going to stop in its tracks unless we become proactive. So that's what you get from these tests. So you get the lipids, including LP little a, you get inflammatory uh, profile, you get a uh, metabolic profile and you get genetic profile. Amazing. And, and you've got a nice, in, you know, potpourri of information to discuss to the patients. Yeah. And then you can really look at where is the risk? Is it diet? Is it lifestyle? Is it genetics? Is it the oxidized cholesterol? And like I mentioned before, I always love saying this because we see like celiac, massive increased risk of heart disease. You would never associate those two things, but autoimmunity and inflammation are massive triggers in otherwise healthy women or people um, that would typically not maybe healthy weight or healthy body mass. That autoimmune component can be a huge trigger. So I love, and you might see that on some of these labs because like MPO or plaque or some of these would show up potentially. Yes. And I have seen it um, because, and I tell people this inflammation of any cause, mm -hmm. of any yes. cause, um, it's persistent. Yes. Uh, it doesn't bode well for aging. So I don't care whether it's heart disease, cancer, autoimmunity, or Alzheimer's, all four mm -hmm. have inflammation at their base. So that's why in functional medicine, we make a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. And we try to identify where it's coming from. Um, we try our best. See, the difference between, if, like, Traditional medicine, symptoms, treatment. Yep. <laughs> with and usually pharmaceutical or procedure. Again, those are appropriate for the right case. Right. But then there's more. <laughs> there's so much more. Well, let's shift to men and women. Um, there's a big difference, especially women after menopause. And um, do you want to talk just briefly about men and women, differences in heart disease, how they present, or what you look at with a woman versus sure. a man? First of all, when you look at symptoms, they can be completely different. Um, I have my own little dictum in place. So that if it's a woman and it's anything above the belly button, it's hard until proven otherwise. Right. Because it can masquerade as yeah. gallbladder pain. It can it, it, women can have no no chest pain at all. Very common is shortness of breath, and also fatigue and dizziness. So uh, you know, very they don't usually have that pain that goes down the left arm, blah, 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 crushing. It's very, you have to have a really high index of suspicion. So presentation is different because the symptoms tend to be different. Um, even the diagnostic criteria are different. And we, I'm just putting this out the last couple of years is that the tests that we look for, whether a person's had a myocardial infarction or a heart attack, is the troponin level. Yet the troponin levels are lower in women than in men. Maybe it's higher, I forget which is which. They're different than the two genders. And that's really important because before we never, this is kind of a new finding. So now we have to know what is arranged for men and yeah. what is arranged for women. And it's, you know, it's pretty well, the, 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 you'll find out when you do the test. Um, even when you do the angiograms on these patients, now women tend to have smaller hearts and they tend to have smaller arteries. And so, and you might not see anything major when you do your angiogram on these patients. I mean, you may, but you may not because they also have a higher intensity, what we call, Mac 
microvascular angina, which means the plaque is in the tiny vessels that you can't see on angiogram. Yeah, it's very common in women. So, uh, and they, you know, it's 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 so, so totally different. Yeah. Let's talk about the menopause. But and it, it, one one thing I want to just mention first is that I, I find this so so it just and I can't I can't believe it still exists. But about fifty two percent of women in this country still think that their biggest issue is breast cancer or cancer in general. And just to refresh everybody's memory, there's about 250,000 women dying each year of heart disease and 80,000 of breast cancer. Yet, you know, I mean, I think it's it, it, it the kind of work that I try to do. It's like women have to know that yes. this is, as many women die of heart disease as men. It just happens later yes. in life, about 10 to 15 years later. And that's the old estrogen connection. Yeah, excellent. So great. Thank you for that overview. Um, so I want to go to medical advocacy, but before we do, because that's one of the things you stand for is in your book, but before we and do, you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are. We're both the medical advocates in, uh-huh. in a way. Um, diet. <laughs> this is a big can of worms and there, I don't think there's one size fits all, but there's certainly principles. What principles do you find most helpful for, for your cardiology patients that are trying to improve their health? For okay. diet? First of all, I'm not going to say don't eat eggs. Because that's so last century. Yeah. Um, I don't make a big deal about cholesterol because cholesterol in your food does not really equate to cholesterol in your blood. Great. So, uh, although, and I really differ with the American Heart Association on this. I mean, I give them credit where credit is due. They've been around since 1926. But when it comes to diet and um, risk factors, they're way behind the, mm-hmm. the scenes. So even things like, uh, I, I basically believe in the Mediterranean diet or a variation of, like, I guess you can call me, I'm between Mediterranean and paleo. Yep. Because I try I agree, to- I agree, 100%. I just want to say yeah. right on with, even with me with cancer inflammation, I find this area is so powerful. Yeah, it really is. And so I don't really, the patients are amazed when, why don't you tell me about cholesterol and what I should avoid yeah. eating what? I said, I'm going to tell you to avoid one thing, sugar. Mm-hmm. because okay. eating sugar is like pouring gasoline over a fire <laughs> and and that's what happens in the arteries right and cancer and autoimmunity and alzheimer's there's fire going yeah. on we want to we want to we want to get rid of it um so that's where diet plays a big role so i'm much into you know low starch low carbs low starchy carbs um and definitely very low sugar yeah. it should be a treat Mm-hmm. Um, so it's Mediterranean, low carbs. Um, those are my basic principles. Um, because, and again, I'm, I, if it doesn't grow, if it doesn't grow in the, if it doesn't run in the wild or grow in trees or bushes, it probably has no place yeah. on your plate. So I tell people if it's a box bag or can, forget it. Mm-hmm. No, I love that because really it is processed foods that contain more additive sugar, chemicals, glyphosate, and like you said, sugar inflammation. Um, before we go into advocacy, I think I thought of one more thing I think is important is hormones. We're both in the realm we you've been at A4M, that's where we met first, and lots of anti-aging principles and, and hormones. And I do believe, obviously, you mentioned this that the major risk factor for women after menopause is their loss of estrogen. Um, my I have a listeners probably. 50, 80% women and the rest men. But let's talk a little bit about women and hormones. What's your thoughts with heart disease and estrogen replacement? Okay, now I'm biased. I admit it because I'm anti-aging. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I do believe whether you're a man or female, you look better, feel better and think more clearly on hormone replacement therapy. Does that mean I in fact, you know, encourage it every patient? No, it's, a, it's an individual choice. But with women, it's very important. Women live in the average, what, 30 years post-menopause? I mean, they have a nice long, lo- lo- nice long lifespan. And um, so estrogen is very important. First of all, I give hormones, not just for symptoms. Yes. I mean, in the old days, you got it for hot flashes, insomnia, night sweats, you know, mm-hmm. brain fog. And I, that's still an indication. I mean, that usually is what a lot of women have as they go through menopause. I look at the health benefits. Okay, how can it improve the longevity and quality of your life? Heart, no, no, but no, no, no doubt about it, because estrogen is very helpful in producing um, and preserving the endothelium. And you lose that when they go into metatosis. But no more estrogen, the endothelium starts to have problems. And that's when you start seeing coronary disease. They could have cholesterol elevation their whole life. And I don't care about it until they hit menopause. 
uh, and if they're not being protected with estrogen. So the estrogen factor is important as far as heart, bone health, mm -hmm. no yeah. question about it, uh, and also brain health. Yes. So uh, I'm in accordance with most, most gynecologists are not functional medicine mm -hmm. or really proactive. So, I mean, I've had patients come to me uh, because I, I treat a lot of women with bioidentical hormones, being that I'm anti-aging yeah. as well as cardiac. Yeah. And they tell me that their, their GYN says, well, you better get on and off them as fast as possible because it's really dangerous. Well, and then they ask me, well, how long should I be on it? Probably the rest of your life. Why would you want to stop? Yeah. Um, but they're encouraged by their gynecologist to stop it as soon as possible. And, you know, we're still quoting the Women's Health Initiative from 2001, yeah. I believe it was. Well, first of all, the average age group, the average age in that group was 71. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, 61, which is pretty late in the game. You know, we're not even looking at premenopausal, right. perimenopausal. We're looking 61. The average age for menopause in this country is about that. So there probably were a lot of patients with heart disease that was undetected. Um, so uh, that was one thing. They also used oral estrogen, which we don't recommend because it goes straight to the liver and you can develop an inflammatory metabolite, which we don't want. We don't want inflammation. And also, come on, they used Premarin and Prempro. I know, right? The fake alternative, or not alternative, but uh, not natural, not biodegradable. Yeah. Well, for example, if you look at mares and horses, right? They have 27 different estrogens. Mm -hmm. Women have three. Yeah. I mean, we're not comparing apples and apples here. It's very good at controlling symptoms, but the long-term side effects, and I do believe the Women's Health Initiative did prove that. There's yeah. more heart attacks, more strokes, you know, you know, and, and so all that was true. It's just, they didn't give women any alternatives. And this is how I got into it. I swear to God, after the Women's Health Initiative, gynecologists all over this country were like stopping, abruptly stopping oh. hormones. They didn't want to get sued. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, I had teachers and nurses come to me and say, you got to help us out here because the gynecologists in this town know nothing. Right. And I said, okay, I'm up for the, I'm up for the challenge. Uh -huh. And then we learned. And that's yeah. really how I got started because I provided a need that wasn't being handled by the, you know, the traditional doctors. So, And I've never had a woman, if all the because I, I, I know how to follow hormones, I've never had anyone develop cancer while they were on HR, bioidentical HRT. I'm sure it's happened, but I've I've never seen one. And I've been doing hormones for twenty since 2000, so 23 years. So I, I I've said this before, but as a breast cancer survivor, I couldn't agree more with you. 20, uh, 2001, that was the year I got cancer at a very young age. And I am uh, obviously studying this for my own health. And I really, really believe that the benefits far outweigh the risk. Even now, I wouldn't say within the first five years, you need to be a little tiny ways out from cancer um, right. to be safe. And, and right. in that sense, and you obviously, we're not giving medical advice here. You need to talk to your doctor, but if right. you're not getting good information, find a functional, find an integrative trained doctor, because there are ways to test like you and I'm sure test metabolites so we know where these right. are and like you said the brain the heart the bones there's so many organs that absolutely need and then the other thing I want to emphasize you mentioned oral versus transdermal it's a really big difference in clot risk the oral metabolites do potentially increase clot risk so I rarely if ever use oral estrogens um progesterone's different oral progesterone yes. is safe bioidentical but transdermal so creams or patches have a very different risk profile for women for clot or heart attack or stroke. So I love that you said that. And it's really individualizing your treatment, yeah. you know, because like I said, I can't, I don't recommend to everyone across the, you know, right. every. Absolutely. But, it's a discussion to say, because if someone's terrified, right. I never add to that fear. I get to, I let, I give them the information and then let them choose what they feel best with because they know their own bodies better than me and they get to choose. And I will just support and give them all the information they can do to make the best decision. So, and I'm totally with you. I'm in the same school uh, because like when I started in 2000, 2000 it was before the Women's Health Initiative. So I would like find one sheets on bioidentical hormones, which no one even knew about back then. I learned it from my A4M and then I'd give it to the patients. Then when Suzanne Summers came out with her book, The Sexy Years, I said, you know what? Just read her book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, yeah. It, it's it's written from a lay person standpoint. And, um, and, that, and that really did help, you know, during the bandwagon uh, as far as bioidentical hormones. So yes, I am pro-hormone and the right patient. Yes. And I think discussion is really important. And I tell the, I, I tell them, okay, I want you to think about this, you know, let's meet each other in three or four weeks, you know, uh, 
do your reading. Yeah. And women are great about it. women do research things all the time. So, I mean, uh, because I have a population of patients that are bright and, you know, and they really are concerned about their health, they do the research and they come back and, you know, and we, like I said, I have never had any any problems. I'll have to adjust things with men. It's one size fits all, but not with yeah. women. Women so, is more, more complicated, but we more rewarding in the way. Yes. So let's uh, shift in our last little bit here to medical advocacy and your book, which is from both sides of the pa- uh, table. Um, and we'll talk about where to get that later. But tell us a little bit about how did you become a medical advocate? What does that mean? And why is it important for our listeners? Well, one of the reasons why I kind of relate to you is because you have your own backstory. And I think when you've had medical, if you're a medical provider like we are, and you go through hell that we went through, mm-hmm. uh, it changed you as a person. So it really, like the first time I, I was hospitalized twice uh-huh. in a span of 19 months. The first time yeah. um, I had my, a very small heart attack. I mean, I'm like, I have no risk factors. I'm not hypertensive. My, I've always worked out. I've never been overweight. I've never smoked. You know, even when I went to Cedars, they said, well, you don't look like the profile. But it doesn't matter because it can happen to anybody. And so I had a stent. And then and then this would have me change. The, with the cardiologist who did my procedure, when to discharge me, he says, well, Dr. Alcott, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you are so buffed and so forth you can create your own cardiac rehab program. I said, okay, I can do that. And then he said, um, but you know what? Now this guy was a, about 20 years younger than me uh, and was about 60 pounds overweight and it wasn't muscle weight. Uh, he said, but you know what? Everything's going to be great because you have the stent in, you're going to do great. And he left. And this is when, when I knew I was going to write a book. Um, I said, okay. He said, I'm good. I'm, everything's fine now because I have the stent. First of all, if, I, if I'm if i so healthy, why did this happen to begin with? Number one. Number two, what can I do to prevent it mm-hmm. from me happening again? And those are the unanswered questions. And then my daughter came up a few minutes later with a writing tablet. Dad, it's time to write your book. Uh-huh. That's what happened. So, you know, I did very well. I had a very small heart attack. But then 19 months later, I ended up in the hospital again, Cedar sinai with... Um, um, and they needed, needed emergency back surgery. I had this condition called spinal stenosis uh-huh. that I knew from 1996. At that time, I was doing triathlons. I wasn't bodybuilder yet, um, but I knew about it. So I'd have a relapse every, let's say, two years or so. But this time, it was so bad. It, I went through rehab and chiropractic. Nothing yeah. worked. I got worse. I woke up one night, and I was I was reading a book, and I'm numb from the knees on down. And I stood up and I just collapsed. I had, I, had, I couldn't walk. I crawled until my best friend, Barry, came to pick me up and bring me to the hospital the next day. Yeah. And I ended up needing surgery. But here's the thing about it that I'm sure you can relate to is that I just didn't have surgery. I had a botched up surgery. And I have permanent nerve damage as a result of that wow. surgery. And not only was it botched up and I had permanent nerve damage that I'm still dealing with today, 15 years later, but um, I have... It was incomplete. So he didn't complete the job. So over a period of years, you know, I'm I'm bending over more and more at the waist because stenosis yeah. likes flexion. It does not like extension. Huh? And it got to be the point in which it was hard to walk mechanically, not because I was short of breath yeah. or anything, just mechanically. So I had a second back surgery this past January. Um, but when you have permanent nerve damage, it changes you, especially if you're an athlete. But yeah. there's certain I cannot do anymore. And it's not because of my age. Right. It's because I have limitations. So so with those two hospitalizations, it really inspired me to write a book because I had to become a medical advocate because when he said, you're going to be fine because you have a new step, I said, this BS is absurd. Right. And, <laughs> and then when I had, here's the other one I want you to hear about, is that when I was hospitalized at Cedars for the back surgery, within the second day, the, the um, discharge planner says, well, doctor, we tried everything we could to get you into rehab, but your insurance wants you to go to a nursing home. I said, a nursing home? Are you freaking kidding me? Uh-huh. <laughs> I said, and she said, we tried everything we could. So here I am in bed, bedridden with opiates, yeah. you know, in pain. And I spent two hours on the phone with Aetna Insurance, determined. Yeah. That's really being your own medical advocate. Right. Just take right. charge. Because the hospital was not going to go out of their no. way. And the next day I was I was wheeled over to the rehab unit. Really? So that's, yeah, I'm a, 
And people say, okay, well, you're a doctor. Of course you figure it out. Not true. Not necessarily true at all. In fact, that's why one of the chapters in my book is a, it's entitled Heroes, because I interviewed about seven or eight people, both men and women, who had no medical background, yet they became their own medical advocates and made some important decisions that affected their lives in a positive way. I want people to know you don't have to be a doctor or a nurse. You just have to have the desire to, 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 to it's, it's work and I'm still doing it. I'm still doing it today. So that's how I got into it. And um, I was inspired to write the book and, but, and although the book starts off with my story, most of the book is really about how you uh -huh. can become a and medical advocate. So this, we talk about nutrition and supplementation and exercise, stress management, mm -hmm. and how to not age ungracefully ever after. <laughs> yeah. What a great message. And I could not agree more. I know we have this such in common because the truth is whether it's the insurance denial, which happens as a matter of fact. So I just think of all these, you know, like maybe older people who don't have advocates or, and anyone can be an advocate, but it's so common for those denials or those standards to be like, oh, you can't do this or you can't do this. Or you, even for me, I'll look back with my own chemo. I literally requested a completely different drug, a completely different protocol. I did a completely different type of radiation. I basically created my own plan that fit for me. And thank goodness I had doctors that went along with it, but it was completely not the standard. I said, I want to do this and not this. And I want to have my chemo in two days instead of one day. And I want to do this to mitigate side effects. And I'm going to take some antioxidants during chemo, even though it's not recommended. And again, talk to your doctor. I'm not advocating that without your doctor's permission, but Absolutely. I did a lot of things that weren't advocated because I knew that it mattered to my own personal journey and health. And I agree with you. I love empowering patients. And even when you and I sit with them, part of it, whether it's bioidentical hormones or whether it's diet or lifestyle, I give them as much information as I can. And then they still get to make the decision. Um, but I'm there like helping them and saying, do you have questions? Yeah. Is there I can help because the truth is we all know our body's best. And even if I believe this supplement or this intervention is going to be best for the patient, if they don't believe it or they're afraid of it, it's not going to do them any good. Right. And that's why I related to you so much in your, in your writings and your postings and so forth, because you put, you're about patient advocacy. Not, not many people are, you know, they pontificate about what they know. Um, and I get in some of these arguments with people, not arguments, but I disagree with some of these people in social media uh, because it's really not backed by science, some of the things they're saying. And I will interrupt and say, you know what? I understand what you're saying, but your your readers need to know this. I mean, I mean if it's really something against my grain, I will intervene. Yeah. But you're absolutely right uh, about it. I did the same. Like, <laughs> I had a, when I had my back surgery on recovering and rehab, I had a friend of mine bring my supplements that they had CoQ10 and fish yeah. oil, yeah. vitamin D. And so, they make their rounds to the, the doctors, or the interns, the residents, the fellows, yep. and the attendings. And they said, What's this? I had everything in a shoebox. I said, Well, this is this, this. And I said, And they looked at me like I was from Mars. Uh -huh. And I and uh, I said, do, do you guys not know about this stuff? Uh -huh. yeah, some of the people are like 20 years younger than me. Uh -huh. Oh, no, no. All we do here is rehab and right. pain medicine. Unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. And like you said, the base of the CoQ10, you can't imagine someone doesn't know the science on CoQ10, but the truth is a lot of doctors still don't. Um, well, I love the pathway you've taken. I love that you've given us some really, really valuable information about the heart, about aging, about biological hormones, and especially about patient advocacy. So obviously, here's your book. Where can people find you, get a copy, both sides of the table? Um, Great. Okay, well, the actually, I have two websites. One is heartwise.com, but if you okay. look, I have my own website for that. It's called, it's a little long name, but it's beyourownmedicaladvocate.com. Okay. So although it's talk, it's my story on both sides of the table, it's really about patient efficacy. So be your own medical advocate.com. It tells it's specific about the book. There's a praise page of people that uh, in, that read the book before it was published. And also uh, it goes straight to my Amazon page. You can buy it. Okay. It's I think it's like $9.95 for the um um electronic or thank you. Okay. <laughs> That's all I need is more screen time. So uh -huh. I, <laughs> I know. Um, or the book. I like turning pages. I'm old, old school. Me too. Me too. So I have the copy there. Um, right. well, thank you again for your time today. Thank you for your information. Right. Thank you for the great work you're doing. If you're listening out there, wherever this podcast is being shown, heard, or watched, you'll see the links to the websites that Dr. Elkin mentioned. And thank you again, Elkin, for your work in the world. Joy to be here with you. Thank you. You too.